listening to Fanboy Radio, the voice of comics. Today's live episode is number 230 with John Byrne. Fanboy Radio is brought to you with a donation from Y2 Comics. Y2 Comics, located at 5276 Trail Lake Drive in Fort Worth, can be reached at 817-263-5888. This portion of Fanboy Radio is brought to you by Funimation and their release of Full Metal Alchemist Volume 2 and the Dragon Ball Z movie Broly, Second Coming. Also available from Funimation is Dragon Ball Z, the uncut Ultimate Edition. See how Dragon Ball Z really began on April 12th on DVD. For more information, log on to www.funimation.com. Now here are your hosts, Scott and Oliver. Howdy, howdy, everybody. Why, as a matter of fact, this is... Fanboy Radio. My name is Scott, and I'm with Oliver. Howdy, howdy. How's it going? I'm awake. Great. <laughs> Good news. I'm awake as well. We had a great time at Cape. That was yesterday. Actually, Oliver, you couldn't join us. That's right. I'm exhausted. Had so much fun work at Free Comic Book Day. Had a great time out there at Zeus Comics. Really a ton of fun. Thanks for coming by. If you missed it, we'll probably be doing it next year. We I'm haven't hoping. Got, haven't gotten the official announcement yet, but it was but such it a success. Good. Yeah, it looks really good. Well, it's a beautiful... Mother's Day yes. here in Fort Worth, Texas, and Fanboy Radio couldn't be much bigger. We have got a living legend here with us today, and he chuckles, as I call him, I chuckle. a living legend. For over 30 years, our guest has been changing comics for the better, working from the most popular titles and characters on out. John Byrne has been breaking ground has had groundbreaking runs on X-Men, Fantastic Four, Superman, Alpha Flight, many more, and has proven himself inside the world of independent comics as well. He is now working as a writer-artist on the rebooted Doom Patrol series, as well as the Blood of the Demons series, and as the artist on upcoming run on Action Comics. We are joined by Mr. John Byrne. Mr. Byrne, how are you doing? I am good. Hello. <laughs> it's great talking with you. Well, it's great to be talked to. It's lonely out here. You know? Oh, <laughs> yeah. I guess it gets a little bit lonely for you comic book guys that crank out so much material. I mean, it's just sitting in the studio and pretty much complete yeah. solitude. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, as a consummate writer artist, you know, which responsibility is more important to you? Yeah, the writing or the or the or the drawing, or do the duties kind of blend together? They, yeah, they blend together. I mean, if you're, if you're doing it right, comics are, are visual storytelling, so the writing and the pictures kind of meld together, and you don't really notice one over the other. Well, it, it just seems like in today's comic landscape, there's a very distinct script writer, yeah. and then a very distinct penciler, but do you try and look past all that into just what's being presented on the page? Pretty much. I mean, I, I, I think my job, whichever of the, let's say, two or three jobs are out there, whichever combination of them are handed to me, uh, my job is to tell stories clearly and concisely and and uh, punctually. Well, let's start off with some comic past talk, and we won't talk too much about it because you've got some great stuff coming up right now as well as in the future, and we want to cover a whole bunch of issues. And you can join the conversation, That's by the right. way, all, all of you listening. That's 817-257-763 number is the number to, to join us here live on KTCU FM 88.7 The Choice. And there's also a form at the fanboyradio.com message board where you can post a question that will that may get on the air. We'll see if it's worthy. <laughs> and uh, But let, let me ask you straight up. This is a very broad one, and you'll probably roll, roll your eyes at this one. But of your X-Men, Fantastic Four... Batman and Superman runs. Which of those four are you most proud of? Most proud? Uh, probably the Fantastic Four. I, I think I think all the pieces came together the most consistently in my, uh, well, it was five years, wasn't it? Five, close to six years on the FF. And I, uh, that's the one I kind of swell with pride the most when uh, when I talk about it. Well, are you looking forward to the movie then as well? No. <laughs> <laughs> Why's that? Oh gosh, um, I, I'm I'm big on what the trailers tell me in movies. You know, I figure the trailers are what they put together to tell me what they want me to think is in the movie. And uh, of all the trailers I've seen for the Fantastic Four movie, there've been like 
two seconds that I went, okay, they got that part right. <laughs> but uh, but the rest of it, I, I've just kind of cringed. So For me, it was the human torch jumping off. I like that part. But the thing... Did they get the thing right? Uh, well, no. Uh, not, <laughs> that's certainly not the voice I heard when I was writing the character, and I certainly can't imagine Ben Grimm engaging in, in, in deliberate destruction of private property, which he does when he picks up and throws that car. I mean, the <laughs> FF are responsible for a lot of collateral damage, obviously, but I don't think they ever set out and say, I think I'll go trash this old lady's car. <laughs> Use it as a weapon, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I absolutely love your run on Fantastic Four. It's Thank in you. trade paperback. It's incredible. I recommend people going out and checking it out. Would you say, I mean, a lot of people put it right on par with Stan Lee and uh, Jack Kirby. Yeah, well, they they tend to say second only to Stan and Jack, and I'll accept that if there's about a billion light years uh, between <laughs> one and two. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, I had a lot of fun, and I, I think uh, I think the readers had a lot of fun, and that's kind of what counts. Does the legendary aspect of, of your run, does that kind of dissuade you from picking up doing another run on yeah. Fantastic Four? Yeah. Um, it's sort of like why, I've heard why, why Ditko won't do Spider-Man. You know, he, he doesn't want to be compared to what he did before, and I feel the same way. I, I would be competing with my own legend, and that's just – I mean, my run on the FF was, was a good run, and I'm proud of it, but I don't think it has ever reached quite the lofty – uh, realms that people have assigned it to in retrospect. I, I'm honestly, I mean, that's that's legendary, the Fantastic Four. But the <laughs> X Men run really, that was very huge. You've come back to X Men uh, yeah, a, a couple, couple times. times, yeah. And honestly, there's a, a lot of people, you know, they know that that Stanley created the X Men, but Some really not the version we know of. No, that's really could be credited in part to you. Uh, right? No? Creation, not so much creation. Extrapolation, maybe. Uh, Extrapolated you know, I'm, I'm, by John Byrne. Put I'll that on the, the cover. Blame, I'll take the blame for Wolverine. <laughs> okay. Know, but, uh, oh, we'll get there, buddy. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, most of the new X-Men were, of course, uh, created by Dave Cockrum and Len Wein. Yes, from the giant size. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Most of them started their lives in Dave's sketchbook as uh, you know, alternate Legionnaire characters. <laughs> I guess just the combination and that that overall feel for what a lot of people think are the you know the the really successful years of X Men. I mean, I don't know. I think of Colossus and Kitty Pryde's relationship. Mm-hmm. I think of so much that that you put out there. Um, any potential return? I mean, you already said you know Fantastic Four. No thanks. X Men return? Question mark. Well, uh, I mean, if 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 the shall we say circumstances arose where I was offered a return to. Uh, Hidden Years, I think I would certainly take that up again. I was having a lot of fun with that book when it was yanked out from under me. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure that I would ever want to go near the uh, the current crew again. I tried that a while back with Jim Lee and Wolf Portacio plotting and and, uh, and penciling, and it was, shall we say, less than fun. So I think I... I you know, I'm just an old fogey here. I want to go back and draw the, the guys I thought were, were cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you mentioned being an old fogey. I won't say that. But no. I do love your retake on the Blood of the Demon series. It's out right now. And we're skipping ahead to present comics, well, but that's, that's okay. That's probably the least fogeyest job I've ever done. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of disturbing myself sometimes when I look at what I'm doing. I'm going, God, where's this coming from? Well, it's real violent. It's real high act. Uh, lots of action you pack mm-hmm. into every single one of these issues. It's a great-looking book, okay. and I say Ophogi because it's a very different uh, Jason Blood than, I guess, more recent continuity. You kind of yeah. go old school on it. It's much closer to Kirby's. Right. Yeah. Yeah, where I'm Jason was as much a central character as, as Etrigan. Mm-hmm. Well, let me, let me actually veer back. Marvel played had a lot of fun playing with the idea of silent comics in mm-hmm. their event, Nuff Said, a few years back, and they mm-hmm. were pretty cool, but they were really nothing like the incredible silent comics that you created over the years in some of your one-shots and, and some of the stuff you oh, just you. C- kind of threw out there. That's getting back to the whole notion of, of what comic books do when they're telling stories, if you can do it. I, o- I always tell young up-and-coming artists that their job is to make the writer unnecessary. <laughs> uh, and that's that's what I you know try to do with uh, the silent stuff, is to tell a story in the pictures uh, to the extent that you don't need words. Right. 
Here's a question from the fanboyradio.com message board from Jim Lujan of Pasadena. John, first off, thank you for all the artistic inspiration throughout the years. Your work is amazing. My question, which characters are your favorite to draw and why? Um, the thing is a lot of fun to draw uh, once you get sort of the zen of the thing going. Batman, obviously, is, is just a ball to draw. Um some of the more complicated characters have been fun. I've had a lot of fun drawing Galactus over the years. Yeah. <laughs> uh, who, you know, you sort of look at him and you go, oh, God, I'm going to go blind. But once you figure out what's going on, it, it's it's fun to draw. And oddly enough, the, the simple characters tend to be the ones that are the, the hardest to draw, like the Silver Surfer. You know, you sit and look at him and go, well, there's nothing to it, right? That's kind of the problem. There is nothing to it. <laughs> the light uh, doesn't reflect – it reflects off of everything. Yeah, you? well, you know, that's – a lot of artists handle it that way, and I tend to, to say, well, that's the chromium surfer. And uh, I'm trying to draw the silver surfer. Silver is lustrous more than it is uh, highly reflective. But, hey, that's just me. <laughs> me being grumpy again. <laughs> well, you equate some grumpiness with, I guess, uh, attention to detail, though. Yeah. <laughs> or I guess others do sometimes. Yeah. I, yeah. I appreciate it. I just, I mean, I think find you a real smart guy. And a lot of people... Uh, you know, you you take a lot of care in the work that you do, and mm-hmm. uh, and they find it the care to translate to complexity. I don't know. It could do uh, uh, too much. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Ot. Curmudgeonliness. I guess. <laughs> that would that would work. I'd wear that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask this. This is our last one for looking back. With with whom did you enjoy the most? Did you enjoy the most creative competition with? You know, did, was there a particular person that you just enjoyed seeing their work and and tried to bounce back in your work? Oh yeah, sure. Um, Frank Miller and I had a had a wonderful uh, rivalry, quote unquote, going. Um, I remember uh, he and I uh, did a did a panel in New York one time at a convention. He'd only been in the business like three or four years, and the seats were set up so that he was sitting directly behind me. And at one point, he leaned forward and tapped me on the shoulder and said, just remember, I'm right behind you, John. <laughs> and, it, you know, I mean, we were constantly looking at each other's works and going, oh, you, you know, look what he's done now. i got to beat that now. And uh, George Perez and I had a little bit of that going, although yeah, George I and I that. come from uh, very similar backgrounds and in, in stylistically. So there was less of it, but Frank and I were constantly bouncing off each other. It was a lot of fun. Well, you mentioned Frank Miller, and he's a genius, of course. And there was a brand new trade paperback that was uh, kind of compiled by Charles Brownstein, Eisner Miller. It came out last Wednesday, mm. and it's awesome. I would, it's from Dark Horse Books. Your friends there, mm-hmm. and I was looking through it a lot today. I was a little bit getting ready for for this interview, and I was thinking, how awesome would it be to have a Burn Miller mm-hmm. compilation where you guys talk about each other's work? And that would be, yeah, that that'd would be, be fun. fun. Well, we got another call. I think we have a caller, right, Britta? Yes, we have Jason from Brooklyn on the phone. Jason, okay, from, Jason from Brooklyn. From Brooklyn. How's it going, Jason? You're on Fanboy Radio with John Byrne. What's up? Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, JB, mm-hmm. if if the current uh, marketplace was no obstacle, what sort of comics would you be doing that you currently aren't? Oh, no, that's interesting. Yeah, that's I, really good. I mean, I've always wanted to do a Western. Um, and I, I think that there's some tendency towards a, a resurgence of popularity of Westerns right now, although I don't think it's trickled all the way down to comics. But uh, even though I cannot draw horses to save my life, I've always, uh, I've always wanted to try my hand at a Western. Go ahead. I, I think we cut you off there. Do you have another no, question, sir? I was just wondering because I, I know that, that JV has very strong uh, opinions on how uh, – on what the proper way is to do uh, superhero comics and, and so forth. But I know he's decried the fact that we have pretty much a one-genre marketplace now. Yeah. And that's, that's very dehabilitating. Mm-hmm. And I know how much J.B. loves superheroes, but I figured that there was a great spectrum of comics which he would love to try his hands at. That oh, absolutely. He hasn't because they yeah. won't sell at the moment, and one does have to make a living of this sort of thing. I mean, I look back at the, at the good old days... Uh, and that, I'm talking even before I was born, so, you know, like when Triceratops were still stomping around. <laughs> and uh, the comics comics were like movies. They had every conceivable 
genre. There were westerns. There were hard-boiled detectives. There were science fiction. There were romance comics. There were funny animals. And we we sit back and go, gee, what's happened to all our readers? And they say, well, we used to put out material that was aimed at everybody who could actually hold a comic book. And now we put out mostly superheroes. I love superheroes. I'd be content to do nothing but superheroes. But I think the marketplace needs to be much more than that. Well, thanks for your call, Jason. Okay, thank you. Thank you. 817-257-7631 is the number to join us. Let's talk a little bit about superhero comics. It's one of my <laughs> favorites, too. Out now, you have Doom Patrol, Blood of the Demon, and up very soon, Action Comics. Mm-hmm. Doom Patrol, yes, yeah, is it out right now? Well, the uh, I just got my comps, so I guess that means it's coming out in about two weeks. Okay, very cool. You got comps, man. <laughs> oh, he did do the book. That's true. Yeah. All right, fine, fine. But I only get like a third as many as I usually do because I only penciled it. <laughs> <laughs> only penciled it. <laughs> I love that. Okay, well, Doom Patrol's your baby. Mm-hmm. Would you would you describe that as as the truth? I mean, you. Well, the... yeah. I mean, it's it's a book I've been sort of heading toward for a long time. I mean, it seems like uh, every five or six years, I'd go, who's Who's doing anything with Doom Patrol? And and the answer would always be, oh, we just assigned it to this guy over here. And then finally, they uh, they handed it to me and said, okay, try something, do what you want to do. And we kicked around a bunch of ideas and came up with this reboot. Britta, I think we've got a caller. We have Zach from Fort Worth on the line. Zach, how you doing, man? You're on Fanboy Radio with John Byrne. Oh, I'm doing great. All right, what's your question or your comment? Well, I actually uh, didn't have a question. I was wanted to comment on Doom Patrol. That uh, other than Grant Morrison, I think that uh, John's current run on Doom Patrol is excellent. And I think these are characters oh, okay. that are sorely underused, mm-hmm. especially because they allow for the weirdness to come back to comics that, mm-hmm. that I really enjoy. And uh, you know, if he could do a silent issue of Doom Patrol, that would be just, <laughs> just now amazing. you're talking. Mm. But, uh, I just wanted to say that I really enjoy his work on that particularly. I've always enjoyed his Thank work, you. but that Thank you. in particular, Doom Patrol is just great right now. So that's all. <laughs> well, thank you, Zach. Well, thanks. <laughs> that's worthy. <laughs> The check is in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> so do, do, do you feel like uh, Doom Patrol brings out any specific thing in you? Because it, se- it does seem to connect with a, a large segment of the readership uh, in a certain way. Um, well, yeah. I mean, I remember back when I, was, uh, back when I was a kid reading comics when I was like 14, 15, 16. And Doom Patrol always seemed like uh, the closest thing to a, a Marvel book that DC was doing. Um, we used to say that, that Captain America was the DC character that Marvel accidentally published, and Doom Patrol was the Marvel character that DC accidentally published. Hmm. And that's the kind of the vibe that I get I'm, uh, as I work on the book. I'm, I'm getting a lot of my old Fantastic Four vibes, not X-Men, because most people think of the Doom Patrol as the X-Men, but they're not really. Their dynamic is different. And uh, it has that that sort of vague echoes of the FF are going through my head as I work on it. Just in terms of kind of like being a science in Vitchers? Yeah, to that to the extent and they're more of a family yeah. than 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 the X Men. Okay, well I <laughs> here's a question. I know it's gonna come up, so let me be <laughs> the one to ask it. Uh do you feel like continuity matters? In today's comics, because it seems like right now we're in the middle of one of those you know conversations that pops up every ten years or so mm-hmm. about whether continuity is the end all be all or should you just throw it out of the window. I don't think we should ever throw it out the window, but I think that uh, continuity, when it works, means Superman's from Krypton, so we don't do a story where he's from Mars. But when when you start to get well, Julie Schwartz used to talk about the archaeologists, as he called them, which were these. The writers who basically can't write anything unless they're digging up something from the past to refer to. And I think that's where continuity gets in our way. When we start to, to dig and dredge and and pull up everything and, and everything has to relate to everything else and it all becomes terribly incestuous. It's impossible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When, you know, if you can't pick up – well, it's like every time I use a character, I have to call an editor and say, okay, well, who is this character this week? Mm-hmm. You know, because we're, we're – we're, what, what are we tapping into and what have we laid into this character? And I remember, you know, again, stuff was simpler, obviously, when I was eight years old. But when I was eight years old and started reading Superman comics, by the time I finished 
the very first Superman story, I knew who everybody was, and I knew what they were doing, and I knew where they lived, and and that's what every issue should contain. But so often, especially with this writing for the trade mentality, as they call it, where you, you don't even get a full story in every issue. Um, yeah, continuity is, is good as long as it's uh, a tool and not a millstone. Well, right. how do you feel about that mentality that seems to be so prevalent right now? Because it does seem like you hear that now that you, you pick up the first three issues of a comic now and it's just set up because they know mm-hmm. they're going to get a trade. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I really hate those first issues where we spend 22 pages for the character to declare on the last page that he's going to become the guy whose name is in the title. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, gee, you know, uh, when when Batman started, they didn't even do the origin for like five years. Uh, so it's 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 become really kind of lazy storytelling, really. It's, it's very easy to just run off at the mouth and take six issues to tell something that, that in the Silver Age they would have told in 15 pages. And uh, I just, I don't like it. I don't like the way it's going, and I think it keeps people away. I mean, who's going to who's gonna start reading comics if they walk into the comic shop and say, I want to start reading The Adventures of Captain Phonebone, and, and the guy behind the counter says, well, you know, you have to have read the last six issues, and you have to read this crossover with these other 12 titles, and... You have to read these trade paperbacks to get caught up. And my my I, producer Britta is nodding her head here. She's <laughs> like, "That's." I completely agree with you. That's why I don't read mainstream comics. That's yeah. why she doesn't read, read mainstream Bertica. comics. Read mine. Pick up at the very beginning. <laughs> yeah. Of the yeah, read his. <laughs> oh, all right. well, guys, we have a couple of callers on the line. Oh, here. we've got. Please we, do. We will come back to continuity. How about that? All right, Britta. Okay. We've got John from Chicago on the phone. John, how you doing, man? You're on Fanboy Radio with John Byrne. What's up? How you doing, guys? Good to talk to you. Good to talk to you, man. What's your question or your comment? Uh, John, first of all, I'm enjoying Doom Patrol as well. And, Thank you. And I think you are bringing that Arnold Drake kind of fun back to the title, which is you know something I had to dig up and, and reprints and, and things to really find out how cool it was. Uh, fun cool stuff, isn't it? Changed in the uh, in the '60s. Um, I'm sorry. Did you hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay. Go ahead. Nick. And then yeah. also, I wanted to ask. Uh, following up on another on, on a previous caller, um, you said that you'd like to get back to a lot of the genres that aren't being covered by. Um, you know, comic books and how yeah. it is such a super mar- a hero market, but aren't the smaller publishers now really addressing a lot of these uh, new genres? And would you be willing to step away from the big two, like you did with Next Men, and 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 really, um, you know, find a, a, a publisher that is willing to do a western? I mean, obviously there are guys like IDW, Moonstone, mm-hmm. um, that are and, doing this. And you know, is that kind of deal something that that you would want to consider? Oh yes, absolutely. And in fact, I've been. Uh... I've been, I won't call it negotiations because that's way too strong a word, but I've been talking to some European publishers because uh, they still do Westerns Can over there. Can you expound on that? Because I just bought Tex by uh, ah, Hubert yeah. and, and the Italian guy, and it was fantastic. And yeah. I also hear that guys are doing stuff with, like, the Phantom for Sweden yep. and, and guys that have kind of fallen off the American market, like Roger Stern, mm-hmm. you know, or even Dick Giordano and, and I guess even yourself if you're talking to Europe and stuff. And, yeah, it seems like they're discovering a lot of guys that are starting to be neglected by the big two. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean it's becoming the graveyard of lost cartoonists, but uh, <laughs> it it is it always has been um, a much broader, um, more expansive and, and and less ghettoized market in Europe. I mean they they don't look down their nose at, at, at comics over there. It's sort of like ha- what happens with so many American inventions; they have to go overseas to be turned into something legitimate and then they come back as, as something legitimate but uh, comics over there when I a couple of times I visited uh, France and Italy and, and Belgium once uh, I've, I've always been impressed by the, the, the breadth of material that's available and it's also kind of unnerving to look in the window of a comic shop in Paris and see Tintin right next to a cover of a gorilla having sex with a woman <laughs> you know, and you kind of go okay uh, <laughs> Not only do they have every genre, they have them right next to each other. <laughs> <laughs> well, That's a sight. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right there. Well, I thanks so much. Tauntaun, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Tintin and Tauntaun. Tauntaun. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thanks for your call, John. Excellent question. Thanks, guys. Thank you. 817-257-7631. Britta is frantically working because we have lots of calls here. <laughs> while, we, uh, while we get to the next call, here's a post question from Ken Lomas. Didn't say where he's from. 
John, do you where do you and this is going to be kind of quick. We have lots of calls. John, where do you see yourself in 10 years from now? Editor, the funnies, animation, comic books? Oh gosh. Well, if if there's still comics in 10 years, I'd like to think I'll still be doing them. Um I have this this sort of long-standing love for these gaudily colored pieces of folded paper. <laughs> Uh, and I, 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 I hope there will always be something like that. Here's hoping. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Britta? We have Mike from Tucson on the phone. Mike, Mike, how you doing, man? You're on Fanboy Radio with John Byrne. What's up? Awesome. Well, first of all, I have to say I'm a huge John Byrne fan. Oh, thank you. And I mostly got into your Marvel stuff, but re- just recently I got an old Action Comics annual and your Man of Steel limited series. And uh, I was wondering, with Jeff Loeb leaving Superman, Batman, is there a possibility you might do a run? Oh, gosh, I didn't even know he was leaving. Um, Me neither. Batman Batman is a very hard character to write properly. Uh, I would love to do Batman, but I think I'd have to have somebody writing it for me because, uh, you know, Batman should be detective stories. And I'm I'm really good at writing stories about two planets crashing into each other. <laughs> but uh, ask me to come up with a locked door mystery kind of thing, a locked room mystery, and I'll I'll come back six months later and say, okay, I think I've got something. And you can't really handle a, a monthly book that way. But uh, maybe yeah, some to maybe do someone with Batman. Maybe someone has to find out why the two planets crashed into each other. Yeah. You think of that. <laughs> Yes, Batman investigating Darkseid. You know, that, that would be interesting. He's in the JLA. I don't know why. He's in the yeah, he's in the well, JLA. Yes, the the current version of Batman certainly should not be in the JLA. There but, you go. Uh, but uh, we, you know, I hearken back to the days when when everybody was pals. You know, and of course everybody was in the JLA because they were all basically the same guy. They just wore different suits. <laughs> Well, there's a a real re- there's a close related question here from Bouncing Boy <laughs> here and in, uh, in, in Dallas. How involved are you in DC's Countdown? Um, marginally. I've got I've got some stuff in the Demon, and there may be a little bit in uh, Doom Patrol, but uh, my my books my my two books at the moment are kind of off to one side, and I really don't know. Uh, what sort of plans Gale has for action at this point? So there may be more involvement there, hmm. but currently I'm I'm you know I'm basically sitting off in my own little corner having fun. Yeah. <laughs> Blood of the Demon is so much fun. In issue three, you, we do see Batman. Uh, mm-hmm. You're great, Batman. I love the cover. I love the interiors. You just spent a lot of time on I think particularly this issue number three of Blood of the Demon, and your Batman is not solving any mysteries. He is just kicking serious butt, <laughs> or you know, he does that well too. He, he does that well. I, I love the ending when he just zips off. So so good, so funny. It it, it almost seems like he's you could you could push him to that uh, like second generation zany Batman if you wanted to. Like you kind of see all sides of Batman. Well, I do. Yeah, the, the the definitive Batman for me was was back in the Dick Sprang days when he'd be swinging in a window on the end of his bat rope and kicking somebody in the head with a big grin on his face because <laughs> he was he was clearly having a good time <laughs> and uh, i've always said you know all this stuff about batman being tortured and, and a psychotic and you know the psycho ninja batman and i said come on this has got to be the most well-adjusted superhero in the dc universe he goes out at night and breaks people's legs that's got to be the best therapy in the world you know and, <laughs> Gosh, I'm feeling really upset about my parents getting killed. I think I'll go beat somebody up. Wow, I feel better. You know, it's uh, I don't see any reason at all for him to be glum. <laughs> in fact, uh, Dave Gibbons, I remember his 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 main comment about uh, Batman and Captain America when I did that. He said he loved the fact that Batman was smiling all the time. <laughs> we got uh, open lines right now. Eight one seven two five seven. Seven six three one. We mentioned continuity a little bit, and uh, I guess one could could w- it would be appropriate to call you the master of the reboot. I certainly. Well, I seem to be Mister Fix It. It's not a job that I <laughs> ever set out to get, but uh, they do seem to call me when they want the barnacles scraped off. Well, what particular skills do you think you have that make you kind of get to wear that crown? I mean, because you are. It seems like you are the go-to guy for that. I think I have. 
Number one, I have a great deal of respect for the history of the characters, and number two, I'm not embarrassed by the fact that I'm doing superheroes. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's that's very, very important, and I think there are far too many people working in comics today who are just embarrassed by the genre. They'd rather be doing, well, they'd rather be in Hollywood making movies, and I wish they'd go to Hollywood and make movies and, and leave the comic books, the superheroes, for those of us who love doing superheroes and who aren't embarrassed by it. Well, what are your thoughts on uh, DC All-Stars? Is it... Uh... A continuity wiping away, uh, kind of a, is it too simple, or are you really digging uh, it? I haven't seen anything of it yet, so I can only sort of comment on what I've heard about it, and what I've heard about it isn't much, so I, 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 think, I'll, I think I'll hold judgment on that until I actually have an issue in my hand. No, no problem. All right, we got a phone call. Britta? Yes, we have Jordan from New York on the phone. Jordan, how's it going, man? You're on Fanboy Radio with John Byrne. What's up? Oh, hey. Um, I have a question for John Byrne. Fire okay. away. What? <laughs> Fire away, yo. Oh, sorry, I have a sore throat. I'm kind of out of it today. <laughs> okay. But the question is, since you've been so heavily involved in Fantastic Four and wrote some really good stories, what are your opinions on the ultimate Fantastic Four, especially the Brian Bendis, Mark Millar run? I actually haven't seen it. it. Completely. I actually haven't looked at it. Um, I, I generally tend to avoid the ultimate books because they uh, they tend not to be the way I envision the characters. And so I, uh, since Fantastic Four is so near and dear to my heart, I, I actually have not looked at the uh, Ultimate Fantastic Four. So. Well, it's not half the fun of reading the Ultimate line. It's just seeing how different people would come up with these characters. Yeah, that that can be fun, but I like the way they were come up with the first time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm an old stick in the mud here. I like it... Uh, I think Stan and Jack did a really good job, and you know we should all just bow down and <laughs> and follow their lead. Okay, well I'm gonna go with that. All right, <laughs> thanks Jordan. Uh, thanks Jordan. Sorry, I couldn't be more illuminating. Sorry Jordan, you've been burned. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry Jordan. <laughs> He's just been taken out. Well, let's talk a little bit about Marvel. I you are, even though you're a current DC creator, I associate you with so many Marvel books. Mm -hmm. What what's your overall thought of the modern Marvel? Well, I, when I when I post on my website, I do spend tend to spend spell Marvel with with M and then a bunch of asterisks, uh, oh. which, which to me just says there's a lot missing. Hmm. Uh, it just doesn't feel like Marvel. And when I say that, I don't mean that it necessarily has to be old fashioned or old fogey stuff, and it doesn't have to be exactly the same kind of comics that that Stan and Jack did. But I don't get the vibe from from Marvel Comics these days that uh, that I used to get, and even I mean, of, of of all the epochs that Marvel has passed through, I mean the the Jerry Conway era was very different from the Len Wein era, was very different from the Jim Shooter era, was very different from the Stan Lee era, but they all felt like Marvel, and it doesn't feel like Marvel anymore. It feels like something else, something that sort of I don't know even how to phrase it. It just I look at a Marvel comic, and I don't see a Marvel comic anymore. Well, let's talk about possibly the heart of the issue. You had a run on Avengers. Are you currently reading new Avengers? No. No, I generally... There are so many comics out there that uh, years ago, I, I sort of fell into the habit of only reading the books that directly affected my work. Mm -hmm. So, for example, when I was writing the Avengers, I would read all of the... Uh, home titles of the various Avengers characters. And when I was working on Captain America, I would read the Avengers and things like that. But since I'm at DC these days, uh, nothing at Marvel affects my work. So the Marvel stuff I, I, I find myself reading tends to be uh, masterworks and essentials. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I don't know if anybody's told you, but uh, Wolverine's an Avenger. Yeah, I heard that. And, yeah. uh, you know, you, you credit yourself a little bit to the, the background of Wolverine. I blame myself. You blame yourself. Okay. And, and the two big issues right now that I don't know if you could weigh on or not, this will be the last big uh, I'm forcing you to answer on Marvel. <laughs> but with Wolverine, there's there's a little bit of overusage there. Just a touch, but and, then there always has been. And, okay, valid. And uh, there's no more secret origin. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Well, I think the main appeal of Wolverine was that we didn't know anything about him. Uh, I always thought that was 
the coolest thing about the character it wasn't his, his adamantium claws or his healing factor or the fact that he was just a tough guy. It was it was the fact that he was a, a mystery man. And with all these superheroes who are supposed to be mystery men, we're all running around with masks on so you don't know who we are, but in fact we know chapter and verse of every single detail of, of their lives. To have Wolverine being something else, to not know where he came from, to not know what he was, but to have ideas about it. Chris and I had a lot of backstory on, on Wolverine, so we were able to sort of drop these hints from time to time. And I think that, that, that works really well. And once you come out and say, well, he's this guy, you know, and his name is Bob Smith or whatever the hell it is, um, then you lose something important. He's, he's not an interesting character anymore. It's like when the Punisher becomes a good guy. You know, it's like, well, he just lost the stuff that was interesting about him. You uh, worked towards laying hints that Sabretooth may be Wolverine's dad. Yeah, well, that was Chris and I were operating on that assumption at one point. The uh, it all came out of a scene where uh, the Sentinels were having trouble determining whether Wolverine was a mutant or not. Some of the readings were saying he was a mutant, and some of the readings were saying that he wasn't. And Chris and I came up with this notion that that Sabretooth was his father. Sabretooth was the mutant. The mutation bred true in Wolverine. So, in fact, what Wolverine was was the first of a new species. And that was why he was reading funny to the uh, to the Sentinels. Well, that's cool. They kind of ran know. with that on Earth-X, I think. Mm. I don't know if you read it in that, but... I uh, haven't read any Earth-X. It was a lot of fun. But, uh, but no, I, Wolverine, to me, is has so much potential, um, but it seems like they are just using all that potential up. And that's that's my personal opinion there. I know I'm not the guest in this fanboy radio, so I'll keep, <laughs> I'll keep going. Eight one seven two five seven seven six three one is the number, by the way. How should character deaths be handled? And character what deaths. what makes Gwen Stacy's death canon while Aunt May's was not? Well, number one, uh, I really wish Gwen had not died. Uh, I really wish that Gwen had just left in the way that Betty did, in the way Liz did, so that uh, we wouldn't have this giant weight tied around Spider-Man's neck that he's dragging along behind him forever, the death of Gwen Stacy, which creates this moment in time that constantly has to be referred to. And how often do we get references to when he broke up with Liz Allen? You know, it's like, not a lot. <laughs> yeah. um, comic book deaths, I think, have to be handled very, very carefully, basically. The best comic book deaths are the ones that happen in the origins that give the heroes a reason to do something, like the planet Krypton blowing up or Thomas and Martha Wayne getting shot. But you have to be so careful when a character dies uh, in the in the sort of course of events. I mean, the Aunt May thing is, is particularly symptomatic, especially when we look back and realize that in the 60s, DC made exactly the same mistake uh, by killing Alfred in Batman. And when you kill off Alfred or when you kill off Aunt May, what you're doing is killing the heart of the book. These characters don't seem like they're all that important, but they are the, the, the linchpin on which the sort of the humanity of the books hang. And, uh, you know, you kill Aunt May and you lose an important part of what Spider-Man is all about. For one thing, for him, you lose that constant reminder of how he made a mistake and he's still paying for it. Mm -hmm. Instead of just another mistake. Another, another mistake, mistake, yeah. Well, I... I... We've been seeing lots of character deaths. Sue Didby is gone mm -hmm. thanks to uh, Identity Crisis. Uh, that was a, 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 cre a creation that was really used to its fullest extent by J.M. DeMattis and Keith Giffen on their runs on Justice League. Absolutely loved that character. Loved it more after I, I've reread it and kind of know that she's died. Mm -hmm. If someone took one of your characters that you've invested that much in, and maybe it was a Hollywood writer, a novelist, his first run in comics kills your character, how would you react? Well, it depends on how the character sits. I mean, like, for example, if it really was my character, as in the next men, I'd be rather annoyed because they shouldn't be touching them. They belong to me. But if it's a character that I've created as work made for hire, if it's a character I've created for uh, uh, Marvel or, or DC, then my my... My response is a little more pragmatic. I mean, I know they turned uh, they turned uh, my Spider Woman into a into a crack whore, 
and my people were coming at me and going, "Oh, John, are you are you ticked off about this?" And I'm going, "No, you know, it's their character, and these are comic books, and that's real easy to fix. If anybody ever wants to fix it, you know, these things ultimately don't really matter." So for myself, I I, I don't lose a lot of sleep over what they do to the characters I leave behind. Mm-hmm. What uh, projects, look, looking a little, a little bit towards the future, what projects do you have for in store for us? Anything that you can make mention? No, basically right now all I've got on my plate is what I've got on my plate. Uh-huh. There's uh, Doom Patrol, Blood of the Demon, and, and Action Comics. Uh, we've been talking about little things. Well, I've been talking about uh, like maybe doing Generations 4, but nobody at DC is actually listening. <laughs> uh, so it's just me saying they're going, Generations 4? Huh? Huh? <laughs> yeah. Um there seems to be a lot of people out there who'd like me to do it. Yes. Um, me. Yeah. Well, there you go. You see? So you should go to New York, and you should stand on Dan Dio's desk and say, Man, I just John. had him last week. I just had him on the show. I should have, dang it, I should have yelled at him about yep. this. Okay. Because yep. that always wins points, you know. <laughs> if you want to get stuff done, that's how to get it accomplished. That's right, Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I, that, the rumor actually was that it might turn into an ongoing series, a Generations Elseworld ongoing. Talked about that. DC is resistant to an ongoing Elseworld. Um, I'm, I think that'll last basically un, until the next British writer pitches one. But uh, <laughs> uh, right now they're they're resistant, but that doesn't stop me from pushing for another miniseries. Well, have you tried pitching it with an accent? Maybe that's the mistake. <laughs> Oh, you're well, born in England. Say, you know, like, I got this idea for uh, <laughs> Generations Four. You know, I think it'd be kind of cool. We love it. <laughs> yeah, that's excellent. It'd be marvelous, wouldn't it? <laughs> no, don't say that word. No, I'll be careful. Oh yes, I'd be DCS. So you you've said that the return of the next men mm-hmm. will happen or might happen when the comic industry improves. Yeah, I mean the marketplace is so mushy that I'm afraid that a book like Next Men which has a very specific audience these days. Uh, I'm afraid it might just vanish without a ripple. Um, so no Ultimate Next Men? Ultimate Next Men, wouldn't that be? Oh, no, oh boy. You could refresh all the new readers. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, I've got about 20 issues worth of stories left to tell with those characters, and it does, in fact, have an ending. And I even know the last line. Uh, so it's kind of frustrating because it's it's not a story I can put somewhere else. You know, I can't turn it into a Doom Patrol story. Right. Um so it would be nice if someday I could just sit down and get it out of my system. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would love to read that. I would love to read the continuation of those characters. Yeah. So much, so much good stuff's come from that that run. That, that was a lot of fun, and it was fun to sort of push myself into different uh, different places, different uh, corners. Of course, what, one of those things that came from that, uh, not directly from your hand, but Hellboy. Hellboy, yeah. That's awesome. A lot of people don't think of these things whenever they <laughs> made just... his debut in X Men. Yeah. That's right. All right, Britta, we got a phone call, right? We do. We have Luke from Connecticut on the phone. Luke, how you doing, man? Um, hi. You're on Fanboy Radio with John Byrne. What's going on? What's up? Um, I wanted to ask John Bryan. Uh, I'm my name is Luke. I'm 12. I live in Connecticut. Hey, Luke. And I want to draw comics one day. Mm-hmm. And I want to know if he had, has like any advice. Well, if you want to draw comics, uh, the best thing you can do is, is, is go out and learn to draw. Uh, and when I say that, I mean we can teach just about anybody how to draw guys in skin-tight suits, but what we, what we need is people who can draw offices and cars and trucks and people wearing ordinary suits of clothing and dogs and cats and bats and aardvarks and all the things that make up the real world because the superhero doesn't work unless he's set in a recognizable reality. So what you want to do is focus your, uh, your, your intellect there on, uh, on learning to draw the world we live in so that you can then drop the superheroes into it. That's my best advice. All right, thanks. Sure. Well, thanks, Luke. Great and and very good advice, by the way. Yeah. So I'm going to grab my uh, Aardvark reference book right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Learn how to draw Aardvarks. <laughs> That's right. It's important. Well, uh, w- let me just ask straight up. I got. I've got to ask you this question, John. Do, mm-hmm. do you think that controversy and or negative press can help comic creators' careers? Ah, uh, depends on the. Well, you know, uh, what, 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 was, what was it? Uh, Oscar Wilde said, "The only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about." Um, you seem to to hold that pretty true. 
I, I certainly get talked about. Even when I don't say things, I get talked about. So I've been known to have an opinion or two. Really? So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I usually keep myself very quiet and to myself and don't say much, but uh, every once in a while I'll I'll have an opinion. Um, and, of course, you've got a flock of people out there who are just ever so eager to misinterpret anything anybody says, which always creates controversy, faux controversy. So, yeah, you know, I mean, it, it can – I guess it all depends on uh, on who the who the creator is. Uh, you know, people say Burns only in it for the money. We we turn our back on him. Todd McFarlane says I'm only in it for the money, and people go, "Wow, he's my hero." You know. So, what are you going to do? Not buy Spawn? <laughs> hey, I don't know. I, don't I would know. never recommend that. I would, I would not say that. Well, I can't. I'm addicted to Spawn. I don't read it anymore, but I still buy it, John. <laughs> really? Well, see, I, that's. That's me. We all, we all get into that. I remember buying Vampirella for about two years after I'd stopped reading it. Oh, it's for the going. covers, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're talking back in the back in the day here, of course. Yes. But uh, yeah, I can remember sort of looking at my stack of Vampirella and going, "I haven't read one of these in like, two years." <laughs> I'm doing that with my Spawn, and it's giving me a migraine. <laughs> yeah. Well, how would your life or career be different different if you did not have a message board? Um. Well, I'd probably have fewer headaches. Yeah. Um, I mean, the the internet thing is 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 such an an amazing tool for good and evil at the same time. I, I was talking to Paul Levitz about it one time uh, because I think the DC message board needs to be a little more tightly controlled. And uh, his response was, "Well, these are the people who pay our salary." And I said, "No, these are the people whose letters we didn't used to print." Yeah. Okay. Uh, exactly. You know, and and that's become the big the big problem I think with the internet is that uh, people think that uh, having the ability to type and hit an enter key uh, gives some validity to your opinion, and everybody's entitled to an informed opinion, but uh, informed opinions are kind of rare out there in cyberspace. Well, I I always like to think I love comic book readers that still have time on their hands to interact with the comic book community. Those are my people. Those are the people that are listening to the show right now. I mm -hmm. absolutely love them. Mm -hmm. But there's also needs to be acknowledged that there's doctors and lawyers who go to the store every month that pick up their pull list, mm -hmm. and they don't have time to yeah. interact with creators, yeah. to go to comic book conventions, to, to, to post on message boards. And they are the silent majority. Would you say so? I don't know if they're a majority, but I know they're out there. I mean, I, I, I really have trouble figuring out what the demographic is these days. I mean, it's it's not 9-, 10-, and 11-year-old kids anymore. At least the majority isn't anymore, which is kind of unfortunate. But uh, as to who represents the real majority, I don't know. Um, it, would be, it would be probably a good thing if we could figure it out, but... That's something else that the the internet actually makes difficult to figure out. You know, well, there's 16 people posting on in this thread over here. Well, no, there's two guys using different names, <laughs> um, Fuzzy Bunny and uh, Mr. Gecko are the same guy. You know. um, I don't believe it. <laughs> trust me on this. Okay, it happens. All right. Well, let's get start talk straight to that point. Comics today seem torn, trying to entertain the loyal yeah. adult readers while attempting to generate interest with the new younger readers. And there's really, it's really difficult to have a middle ground. It is. It is. It's, it's tough to come up with product that will appeal to somebody who's been reading the books for 25 years and will still be accessible to somebody who's just picked up their first issue. Right. Um, and again, you have, you have different classifications of the guys who've been reading comics for 25 years, too. I mean, you can have somebody who's been reading comics for 25 years and who still understands why he's reading comics, why he started and why he's, he's still there. And then you have, at the other end of that spectrum, you have the people who have sort of grown up and matured and changed, and they think that the comics should grow up and mature and change. And when we start to appeal to them or play to them or pander to them, that's when we really make it difficult to bring in the new readers. Hmm. So let, let's clear the air a little bit with some definitions. Let's have some fun with some definitions hmm. here. All right, word balloons versus yeah. word bubbles. Yes, uh, civilians tend to say bubbles, but the uh, the correct term is balloon. And the reason we call them balloons is that they have strings attached. 
<laughs> those little pointers that go down and uh, indicate who's speaking. Bubbles don't have those. I've never seen a bubble with a tail. No. Uh, it's it just it's very very small detail though, isn't it? I mean, it's really not a big deal, is it? No, it's not a big deal, but it's one of those things that uh, if if somebody referred to the 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 wheel on a car as the spinner thing. <laughs> uh, you'd say, okay, I know what he's talking about, but that's not the term. See, now that's an appropriate analogy right there. Mm-hmm. Very good. So what's the difference between remakes and reboots? Good question. Um, well, a reboot, of course, starts over right from ground ground floor. It's what I did with Superman. It's what George did with uh, with Wonder Woman. And it's what Frank did with uh, Batman because with year one, but he did a stealth reboot. He didn't tell anybody. Uh, the remakes, it, it, it's it's... I mean, there's all these different ways that characters can get relaunched and changed and and fiddled with. It. I, I've often I often point out that uh, the entire DC universe as we know it today is a reboot that began in the in the in the 50s when uh, suddenly a new Flash, a new Green Lantern, a new Atom, a new Hawkman appeared right alongside the same Superman, the same Batman, the same Wonder Woman who had been in the JSA with the original versions of those characters. And, you know, years later, we needed a retcon to uh, retroactive continuity to explain, oh, yes, uh, Jay Garrick is, is a comic book character, but he actually lives in, a, in an alternate reality. One of the greatest comic book stories ever done, The Flash of Two Worlds, and boy, there are days when I wish it had never been done. <laughs> <laughs> I like your rule about specialty or specialties, yeah. where the Flash, of course, beats Superman yeah. in every instance because all he could do is run. That's all he does. So if give him the, that. If you're the fastest man alive, you get to be the fastest man alive. Like the, who's stronger, the thing or the Hulk? The Hulk. You know, that's all he's got. <laughs> the minute you make the Hulk smart, you lose what the Hulk is about. You know. That's true. I like that. So why even? I mean, you always loved watching the the characters fight each other. You say one mm-hmm. of your favorite things was uh, Superman versus Spider Man, the very mm-hmm. first one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's fun to have characters bashing off each other, and it's also fun to have mismatched characters. Uh, I, I noticed an odd tendency in in uh, a lot of the postings online when I first went online about 10 years ago and people were talking about team-ups they'd like to see between the two companies. And it would always be stuff like Green Arrow and Hawkeye. <laughs> and I'd go, why Green Arrow and Hawkeye? I mean, that's a big yawn. Superman and Spider-Man is interesting because Superman is so much out of Spider-Man's league. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. Batman and the Hulk. Oh, my God. You know, um, Batman and Captain America, they're operating on the same level and they're both just human beings, but they're very different guys. Did you like JLA Avengers? Yeah, it was, it was fun. Yeah, you know, I, liked I mean, it. it was. It got a little kind of Where's Waldo after a while, but uh, <laughs> you know, when 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 uh, when you do a book like that, you won't, you really can't avoid that. Yeah. What's your dream project? If there was no red tape, if there was no barrier on anything an editor would say to you, or or even like personal property, if you could grab someone else's creative property, something like that, what? job what fight what series would you work on mm. well, yeah. star wars i've done so much no not star wars okay no. sorry i've done so much there's <laughs> um there's there's very little left the the one project that i didn't get to do mm-hmm. that was actually in the pipeline you remember when uh marvel and archie did archie and the punisher yes well <laughs> i remember that yeah i said let's do archie and the Predator. <laughs> Let's get together with Dark Horse and do the Archie gang shipwrecked on some island with Predators running around all over the place. And the Archie company was, was, was all, all for it. We were ready to go on that. And then, and then Dark Horse said, no, that would damage the, the, the franchise. It would hurt the Predator. Of the man. Predator? Oh. And I thought, oh, man. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so that's the, that's the one I didn't get to do that I think would really have been a hoot. Oh, that would have been great. I really, I think I still have Archie Punisher. That's funny stuff. <laughs> Here's a message board post from Coconut Monkey, and who knows who he really is? John? Who is Coconut Monkey? Who is he? When he's alone in the dark, who is he? I don't know. He's had 76 posts on my message board, so mm. he's from Tuscan uh, in the uh, in Arizona. Sorry. Uh, when do you? When will you creator do creator own stuff again? 
and will you stay with Dark Horse even though there is no more legend? Um, I don't know when I'll do create our own stuff again. It'll mostly be when I have another idea or when I think that the marketplace is, is uh, conducive to going back to next men. I'm not sure I would necessarily want to do it with Dark Horse. Uh, there are so many other places to go these days, and I, I do like to explore other venues. So it's a question of uh, just the market, really, right. is, is what dictates it. Well, you know, we've got about five more minutes. Now is the perfect time to give us a call, 817-257-7631. I tell you what, I, I've been excited about a lot of things in comics these days. Uh, there's a lot of things going on. Dan why, did, why are you pretending? Why, you know what you want to talk about. What do you mean? <laughs> you want to ask, is he excited as you are about Star Wars? So, he already <laughs> said he wouldn't do it, so but why I'm would he I'm talking be excited? about the movie, though. I'm excited Just about Star Wars. Star Wars. And that was that was such a great movie back in uh, '77. I, I wish they'd done more with it. Oh. <laughs> no seen, love for the Lucas. Have you seen any of the new ones? I saw. Well, I lost interest in in Star Wars halfway through The Empire Strikes Back. Oh, oh my gosh, John Byrne! <laughs> you didn't. Yes, I did. I mean, the original movie, Star Wars, is one of my favorite movies of all time. But the stuff that came after. I just it just felt like they were shredding this wonderful little movie and trying to turn it into this giant. John, I didn't think you could offend me on my own radio show today. I didn't think I you could even do it. I haven't started yet. Okay. All right. Well, oh, we'll get back to Empire Strikes Back. Britta, we got a caller. We have Eric from Wisconsin on the phone. Eric, right. how are you doing, man? You're Eric, on Boy Radio. Are you as inflamed as I am? <laughs> he probably wasn't. He probably couldn't hear that. But Eric, sorry, you have a question for John Byrne? Yeah, I actually got to think of it. Never mind. Uh, oh, never mind. Why? Okay. No, dude, you can do it. Anyway. You can do it. Called stage fright. Bye. Oh. Oh. Oh my goodness. I we've never had someone panic think and pull the ripcord. I was yelling too loud, Oliver. Thanks for the effort. Uh, scared <laughs> him off. That, hey, it's what happens. It's radio. It's not. A, it's not a message board. It's not out there beating up civilians. It's not a message board. <laughs> it's uh, and it's but it's not a comic book panel either. You know, it's not a it's not a panel at a comic con. You said you will never do comic conventions anymore. Uh, no, probably not. Why not? Oh. Your people love you. Did you eat like three Doom Patrols? People calling in for no reason, just saying, "I love Doom Patrol." Sure. The 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 big problem is okay. Number one, I really am getting to be an old guy here. Okay? Oh, John. And it takes it out of me. When I was when I was when I wore a younger man's clothes. And I was just starting out in the business. I used to look upon going to a convention as being a vacation. I'd take three days, and I'd go to San Diego, or I'd go to Chicago, or I'd go to Atlanta or someplace like that. And, and then I'd come back, fly back Sunday night, hit the drawing board Monday morning. And then it got to be Tuesday morning, and then it got to be Wednesday morning, and then it got to be Monday of the following week. And now it takes me about two weeks to recover from a convention. It really takes it out of me, and it's just not cost-effective. Well, that makes also, sense. you know, that's time I could be sitting at the drawing board. So your your question is, do you want me at a convention, or do you want me drawing another issue? Don't make me answer that, John. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just messing with you. Well, that makes sense. Unfortunately, when you just talk to John Byrne, he makes sense. You know, when you just take little sound bites from him, little clips from his message board and post them around, those don't make sense. But I don't know. Yeah. All right. Hey, I got to tell everybody, <laughs> check out fanboyradio.com for more interesting conversations about this episode. Uh, people were talking about the John Byrne episode. Thank you so much, John Byrne. My pleasure. Oh, it was My a great pleasure. hour. Thank you, Britta. Thank you, Y2 Comics and Funimation. And thank you, Oliver. Thank you. This has been Fanboy Radio. The voice of comics and people who were good for a whole hour. You so were you great. You, you were good, me. Oliver. Oh, you owe me. Oh. <laughs> Y2 Comics, located at 5276 Trail Lake, Fort Worth, can be reached at 817-263-5888. And from Funimation Productions, the creators of the Dragon Ball Z series, Kitty Grade, Lupin the Third, Fruits Basket, Blue Gender, and many more. For more information about Funimation Productions, you can find them at Funimation.net. I'm Britta, and for Scott and Oliver, this has been Fanboy Radio. KTCU FM, Fort Worth.
Good evening and welcome to another edition of The Rock Menagerie here on FM 88.7 The Choice. I'm Dale Gleitz. For the next two hours, taking a trip to The Choice Archives as occurs each week at this time. Here's a brief weather forecast for you. It's fixing the rain. That's all you need to know about that. Coming up uh, tonight, we have a special theme. We could have done Mother's Day songs. We could have done songs about rain. But instead, we're going back 30 years for a sort of a time capsule look at the way radio was in May of 1975. We have top 30 countdown from that week of 1975. And in true Rock Menagerie fashion, we're going to play back the top 29 from this week 30 years ago. Getting us started, we've got Elton John. Pinball Wizard, you're hearing it tonight on the Rock Menagerie, 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 on the Rock 